invite now uh, Ilio Riboli, who is the professor of cancer epidemiology and director of the new School of Public Health of Imperial College in London. And Ilio will give the first talk on the EPIC cohort studies. Please. Thank you, Bert. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure, clearly, being here uh, in this very important uh, day. Um, that's not my slide. I'm not sure whether to go to my slides. It's done, done. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll combine my, my presentation is uh, combined with uh, that of uh, Isabel uh, Romeo from, uh, from IARC. And uh, I hope you, you don't mind if I start with something which is very dear to me as was is when when i met dimitrios i was uh, doing my master of science in epidemiology here at harvard uh, and uh, in, in only meeting and course and there there was uh, this uh, amazing person uh, i mean uh, somebody obviously older than me who was sitting there taking notes uh, as a as an audit uh, uh, auditor in the course, and we ended up sitting very often together. We were a little bit uh, outlier for age at that time, and we were immediately identified by uh, by Oli as the you know the uh, the Southern Mediterranean uh, gang uh, uh, <laughs> making uh, notes. And he, I remember uh, Oli was uh, uh, often coming up with uh, some expression in Latin, and then he would uh, turn to us uh, and. Uh, uh, assume that obviously we would uh, do a um, si simultaneous translation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that, that was uh, a, a very, very interesting, and for me was an humbling experience because I could see, uh, obviously already at that time, you know, Dimitrios as a, as a giant in thinking, in epidemiology, in science, and uh, see him there. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with the humble attitude of learning and that is something is one of those things that you keep in your mind you know, for, for the rest of, of your life and I actually uh, Dimitrios taught me that there is no limit age limit in in learning and uh, to have a modest attitude and try to understand uh, is a major drive in uh, our duty as a scientist so that was the first impact was 1982. We had a number of opportunities for chatting, discussing, uh, dreaming. I was a cancer researcher already at the time, a cancer epidemiologist. And uh, Dimitrios thought that most of what I was doing was a complete waste of time because I was essentially <laughs> working on, uh, on tobacco that was already clearly identified. And I was working on occupational exposures that clearly are important for lung cancer but were uh, unlikely to explain the big variations that we know, knew already at the time existed in different populations around the world. Um, so our path separated, but shortly after, I went to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, uh, well, via, via my uh, National Institute of, of Cancer Research in Milan, um, and, uh, and this is where our path uh, crossed again. Because in the meantime, obviously, the paper on passive smoking, the New England paper, uh, came out, uh, Dimitris paper and uh, Irayama paper. And, and then, then Dimitris came, obviously, to IAC in Lyon and said, we need to do more. And we had a number of discussions there on what can we do more. Uh, first of all, we wanted to uh, do a study to see whether uh, what we measure with questionnaires about self-reported exposure to passive smoking. Now, is it yes, fine, but was, uh, was uh, let's say, a reasonable, a reasonable measurement of actual exposure. And second, and this, this links with the, with the previous presentations, uh, Dimitrios was always very, very, very eager to understand why. So the second thing I've actually learned from Dimitrios was uh, don't, don't, don't get stuck into the black box epidemiology. Try to move forward. Go to the 
thinking in terms of modeling, th of, uh, th thinks in terms of uh, biology, thinks if what you find as a biological meaning and don't get stuck simply with, uh, uh, let's say, statistical association. And, and there, Dimitris was uh, uh, clearly a, a leader once more because working with some pathologists in Athens, and interestingly enough, working with uh, some of my uh, old friends, uh, pathologists uh, in the University of Trieste, was one of those places where, uh, for old Austrian tradition, pathologists were still doing autopsies on more than 50% of people dying in that city at the university. So we brought all this together, and there was this idea that uh, there were some very well-known lesions, early lesions, in the, uh, in the alveoli, or alveoli of, the, of the lung in smokers. And the, there were some research suggesting that these lesions had also been seen in people exposed to uh, air pollution. And then one plus one, the idea was there must be something that occurs uh, also in the lung of uh, people exposed to passive smoking, if passive smoking has an impact for real and is not simply a spurious uh, co uh, co uh, association confounded by many other confounders that we are not able to adjust for. And this is how we ended up uh, setting up this project in Athens and uh, uh, at Trieste uh, Medical School in collaboration with IARC that ended up with this publication in, in, in JAMA on active and passive smoking pathological indicators of lung cancer risk in an autopsy study, which did find that in blindly analyzed tissues, the tissues of uh, subjects heavily exposed to passive smoking, and there was obviously plenty of heavily exposed people to passive smoking in Athens in those days, uh, did have some intermediate, some lesions were intermediate between those of very active smokers and those of uh, never smokers uh, and uh, never exposed to passive smoking and living in uh, non-polluted uh, area. So that, that was, uh, again, a, a great experience. Uh, we created this uh, group uh, with a study in 10 countries uh, for the 10 country collaborative study. Dimitr was always the inspiration and very important, was always there to ask the difficult question, was always there to say, are you sure that this is right? Are you sure that this is obvious, um, but despite being obvious, um, maybe wrong? So that was uh, you know, the, the critical spirit. Uh, it was always one step ahead of us. So that was uh, the 80s. And um, as the 80s were coming to an end, there was a new, something new coming at the horizon and was the idea that, well, nutrition may have to do something with cancer and may actually have to do a little bit more than we thought before. And here the debate was huge because uh, uh, clearly at Harvard, Walter has been, you know, <laughs> the, f the front runner with setting up the nurses' health study and we were all looking at Walter as a, you know, uh, the, 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 the star that was moving ahead. And the big question was, sh what should we do in Europe? I had collaborated for a few years in Malmo with colleagues who claimed to, well, had a strong interest in setting up a prospective course study, but then there was a big discussion, should we do it, should not we do it? And the debate was, uh, what's the additional advantage of having prospective course study to understand the relationship between diet, nutrition, related factors, and cancer risk. Because if you don't answer clearly to this question, then investing uh, tens of millions of uh, any currency, euros, uh, ecus in those days, dollars, uh, into a 20 years effort uh, would make absolutely no sense. Dimitris had a key role because instead of jumping blindly on the idea Sure, we do prospective core studies. He has pushed us to the limit all the time in thinking very carefully what type of data we collect, why we collect the data, why we collect biological samples. Uh, and the question was always, show me that by doing this, you will do something that is better than the case control study that we have already done 
in, in the past. And I must say that this was extremely important. Thanks to his input, uh, we decided to uh, take a huge risk and at that time and embark in a major biological component of the project. We set up a biorepository with nine million samples. And I must say that in, with all the complexity of doing this type of work in Greece, thanks to Antonia, Tricopolo, and Dimitrios, they were able to set up a fantastic component of EPIC in Greece with very good high quality data with one of the best follow-up data you can, you can imagine and with a biorepository set up in the uh, university at Athens and you see this 28,555 participants. So again, I think that EPIC would have never been what is now in terms of density of the data, collection of the uh, of biological samples uh, and anthropometric uh, measurement if it had not been because of this continuous challenge we had from Demetrius. So uh, the, the 90s ended. Uh, we were all smiling, as you can see in this picture. <laughs> not only because this is Ragusa in Sicily, is uh, one of the you know, most enchanting places where you can be in, the, in that island. This is a completely baroque architecture, all built in a very short period of time. Uh, perfectly preserved and never modernized that side because there is a modern city on the other side. So there is the old city and the nice city. And Ragusa is one of the centers, of the epic centers. It's the epic center in, uh, uh, in Sicily where we have about 10,000 epic participants. And around nine, uh, well, that must have been uh, 2001 probably, we had a meeting of, again, another success story from uh, from uh, Dimitrios and, and Antonia. I would say this time, if you allow me, from Antonia and Dimitrios. And was the setup of the EPIC Elderly, which was the first uh, study, a prospective study awarded by the European Commission to fund the investigation of aging within a large court like EPIC. Uh, so they were really front runners. Uh, uh, now there's been a huge increase in research in determinants of healthy aging. Uh, in 1989, this was really visionary. And they were successful on the first run, they were successful on the second run, they've been successful on the third run. So I think uh, Antonia, I should say Antonia, uh, uh, the, there's been more than 15 years of consecutive successful funding of this component, you and uh, uh, and Dimitrios have set up. Now, uh, at that time, we were having endless discussions on uh, how to analyze the data, because we were interested in nutrition. And there were two contrasting views. One, con one view was, we need to identify food patterns. When we identify the food patterns existing in the population, then we see what's the, the relationship between healthy aging and these food patterns. The other one was, no, we should just look at the people who live longer and the people who didn't live longer. Obviously, we have prospective data, so we can look in the best line. And then we compare the food partners of those who live longer and those who don't live longer. A priori, a posteriori, food patterns. And that meeting, besides the blue sky, uh, was really very intense with a, a lot of disagreement on what to do. And then Dimitrios came out with a very simple idea which is his Mediterranean diet score, where he say, if it works, it should work with simple way of computing this. I remember having a, an evening uh, discussion with Dimitri, so he said, don't complicate stuff. If it is read there, must be there, even if you look at simply below median, above median, for a number of factors. You combine them, create a score. He went on and got the paper in New England that was obviously a great recognition of, of his intellectual capacity to focus on uh, how to solve uh, complex problems with uh, a very smart uh, model, basically, data analysis model. Many things came, followed, that, followed that, and there are other, other colleagues who will talk about Mediterranean diet. But I really would like to, to say how much is uh, Dimitrios' leadership has been felt, recognized, and, uh, 
and still is recognized for having been put together with Antonia, the leader in this area. This is my penultimate slide. And I know that other people, other colleagues may talk about the hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, I'd just like to cite this one because has been, this was maybe one of the last paper in which I had the opportunity to work closely with, with Dimitris because of busy life and so on. And I really think that we would have never come up with these results, which at the first sight I, I had difficulty to believe. Then obviously there is the explanation. APIC is a, uh, is a kind of self-selected population, much more healthier than the general population, and so on, and so on, and so on. But the, you know, the, the role of uh, obesity in the overall uh, uh, attributable risk of obesity is, uh, is, uh, is astonishing, clearly. Clearly, we have an underrepresentation of people with hepatitis because 10% of the court are blood donors, so by, by definition they don't have hepatitis B or C, but, but still gives a very different picture, gives the picture of what the etiological factors for liver cancer will be now in the future. This is not the past for once. This is the future. It's the future in a society where the hepatitis B and C will become progressively less frequent and where, unfortunately, obesity has already become much more frequent. So these are very pertinent results from a research and public health point of view. I would just like to, like to conclude that I'm here not only as a, myself, but uh, as an old friend, uh, a colleague, but also uh, I bring, uh, the, 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 so the, let's say, all the thinking, uh, emotion, and, uh, and aff affection that the entire EPIC steering community all, always uh, have had for Dimitrios. And this is a meeting where uh, Dimitro could not come. He wasn't unwell, but uh, as you see, Antonia was, uh, was there. And uh, thank you for organizing this wonderful day. Thank you, Elio. I now call immediately upon Isabel, Isabel, Isabel Romeo, who is uh, also talking about the EPIC studies. She is the section head of nutritional epidemiology at IARC, the International Agency of Research on Cancer of the UN in Lyon, France. Please. Yes, thank you very much, and, and I'm very pleased to be here, and thanks for the invitation to participate to this tribute to Dimitri. I actually had the chance to uh, meet Dimitri when I was a student here at the School of Public Health quite a while ago and benefit from his advice. And uh, later, when I joined IARC five years ago uh, as part of the APIC research team, uh, that was really a, 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 a wonderful uh, possibility to interact with, with Dimitri. So today I'm going to overview some of the uh, contribution of Dimitri through the EPIC study to an understanding of uh, the breast cancer etiology as well as um, the uh, hepatocarcinoma uh, cancer. Um, in 2007, uh, Dimitri received at Ajax the Medal of Honor for his uh, outstanding achievement in cancer prevention. And uh, at that occasion, give a lecture on breast cancer risk from epidemiology to etiology. And Pagona mentioned the, this, uh, what, uh, the, the paper that came out uh, after this presentation. Here you see Dimitri in the auditorium of Ajax uh, giving his, uh, his lecture. And um, so uh, the three components that were the, the most important in terms of uh, understanding the etiology and the natural history of breast cancer that were mentioned already, the number of memory uh, tissue stem cells and that were very well presented by earlier speakers, the role of mammotrophic hormones, which affect the expansion of um, initiated crawl, and this dual effect of pregnancy, on the one hand, can increase the risk of breast cancer just after pregnancy, and uh, on the other um, hand, uh, convey long-term protection by uh, differentiation of mammary uh, tissue cells. And those were the, the really major three components that can really accommodate what we know today about the etiology of 
of breast cancer. And I think it's, it's important to mention that it was already said that it was really a visionary at that time in the uh, 1990 to think about all the import importance of the intrauterine environment and the early years at a uh, factor that might influence breast cancer. This vision about the pregnancy and this exposure to hormones which might have a dual effect and the role of all the mammotrophic hormones on the structural breast cancer which also allow to identify some specific window of exposure that might be more important just around puberty as well as the period between puberty and first pregnancy where the longer period will increase uh, the risk for uh, cell um, um, differentiation with the first pregnancy. And uh, right now, really, there is a landmark of research on breast cancer, which is really the last course of breast cancer, which really uh, uh, based on all what was proposed by uh, Dimitri uh, uh, early on. And we, we need to look at breast cancer in a longitudinal way, and um, Jen presents very well all the uh, stem cells issue and how IGF-1 might an effect. And there is currently several birth cohorts who are trying to understand how early exposure and exposure during pregnancy might affect cancer later on in, in life. Um, in terms of the dual effect of pregnancy, and uh, based on this 1995 paper, uh, there was some uh, investigation in the large EPICOR that Elio uh, presented earlier. This is uh, a, a huge study in Europe with uh, 500,000 participants and with uh, long follow-up. So with the power to look at different factors for uh, breast cancer, it was very well shown that this period between uh, menarche and first time pregnancy was very important for the risk of, of breast cancer. Um, in terms of mammotrophic hormone, there's been also a lot of work within the EPIC cohort to try to understand the role of estrogen, androgen, prolactin, and other hormone in the etiology of breast cancer. And I'm just citing a couple of those papers that came out from this, uh, the EPIC study, who really showing the importance of sex, sex steroid in premenopausal cancer, in particular androgen testosterone, uh, the, the role also within this uh, post uh, menopausal cancer, the study on C-peptides and the role of uh, insulin that uh, might affect also the breast cancer uh, later on, the role of IGF-1, IGF-BP3, uh, which were linked also to um, breast cancer and following what's been shown also in the, in the nurse and cell study and uh, the role of prolactin as well, which uh, has been uh, recently linked to uh, breast cancer. And certainly uh, with a very good um, anthropometric measurement, the importance of weight in postmenopausal women, but also the weight change, which has been really linked to an increased risk of breast cancer in postmenopausal women. So uh, there is many ongoing study. We have epigenetic study ongoing as well, which is in the legacy of all the things thinking of Dimitri and all the, uh, this uh, critical thinking he had about the etiology of, of breast cancer. And now I would like to review briefly also uh, some very important contribution on hepatocellular carcinoma that Elio mentioned earlier. Um, there was some hypothesis, and we know that some factor of tobacco smoke have uh, an effect of, uh, on liver cancer, but there have been a lot of controversy about is it really the smoking or is it confounded by hepatitis uh, infection and alcohol consumption. And uh, one of the major epidemiological study who looked at uh, this issue was done by Dimitri, where he showed a strong association between smoking and hepatocellular carcinoma in the absence of hepatitis uh, infection. Um, this study was followed by a larger study and confirmed that smoking was a major contributor to hepatocellular carcinoma in population where HPV had a very low infection rate. And that was later uh, also uh, proved within the large EPIC study, which uh, showed really the importance of smoking and uh, with uh, quite a large number of cancer cases. And there is a, a very important legacy in this work that was started by Dimitri and also looking at very different uh, risk factors within the uh, 
many cancer, but in this case, hepatocellular carcinoma, and also a metabolic mechanism. And, and within Europe, EPIC really is the largest study where those, many of those cancer can, can be studied with sufficient power. Um, so I'm uh, also going to show a couple of important paper, and I think uh, Elio spoke about hepatocellular carcinoma and, and obesity that all was also very uh, well uh, um, um, proved within the EPICOR, the role of diabetes and insulin uh, insufficiency, uh, the role of vegetables uh, as uh, protective also for hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, the importance of fish uh, as well, as well as the importance of uh, the uh, increased risk linked to a diet rich in carb fast absorbed carbohydrates, the role of dietary product, all the, the inflammation and the metabolic biomarker, the protective effect of circulating vitamin D on hepatocellular carcinoma, and the role of coffee and tea, which is currently a really a very important uh, um, uh, nutrient that we're um, showing a protective effect. And more recently, all the work which is done on the metabolomics, trying to understand uh, the pathway for hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, this is really uh, uh, through the discussion with, with Dimitri, the, all the EPIC community uh, has been uh, working together to uh, try to better understand uh, this etiology of, of those cancer. And uh, I, I just want to say that within IARC and the EPIC community, Dimitri will be remember how these outstanding scientists with uh, critical thinking and a great teacher that always um, try to help to answer complex questions, but in, in a very clear way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. Elio, may I invite you as well, because I would like to ask whether there are questions or comments. Even suggestions are welcome. Yes, please. So if I, if I understand correctly, if you understand correctly, the question is, uh, uh, is whether we have done anything on maternal diet in EPIC. And the, uh, unfortunately, uh, the short answer is no. And the, there is an explanation, because the explanation war is that when at that time we were trying to identify uh, how much we can ask to 522,000 people, uh, there were I know, uh, some questions that ended up in the final list and then some questions that were not. And very sadly, I would say, uh, we did not have any question about diet. Uh, obviously, it would not be possible to ask about the, the diet of their parents for a number of reasons and generations, but we could have asked women which diet they had when they were pregnant or before being pregnant, but we didn't have, we did not include those questions. So that means that maybe other studies out there may have this information, but we can't contribute. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Isabel, I, I have a question for you. You mentioned diabetes and hepatocellular carcinoma. You men mentioned tentatively coffee and hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, can you make the link between coffee consumption, diabetes mellitus, and hepatocellular carcinoma? Yes, of course. I mean, coffee has been uh, found to be protective of diabetes, uh, actually, and uh, although in the EPIC study. So, yeah, that's make the a link. So you're investigating that further? Is that 
Yes, I think, well, you know, AP, uh, I haven't uh, worked um, personally in it. We have an arm of the EPIC study which is called Interact, and where maybe, Elio, you want to say a little bit more about the Interact, which really focusing on the, the predictor of diabetes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Isabel. So we, we have reanalyzed, uh, uh, and um, we have actually a paper which is under review, uh, where we analyzed the relationship between coffee drinking, mortality, and within total mortality, mortality by causes. What comes out is very interesting, is that there is an overall reduction, like was found uh, in, the, um, in the paper of the M uh, American Association of Retired Persons, uh, led by Rajmi Sinha. So we find that the more coffee you drink, the lower is your mortality. Great. Uh, then if you go into the, the causes, sub-causes, we find that the major reduction is for cancer of the digestive tract. And then if you go more deeply, this is where Dimitris would have been happy. I mean, he was happy about these results. Uh, there is a particular reduction on mortality for uh, liver disease in general. The relative risk is 0 0.30, something, a uh, huge effect. Um, and, uh, and the effect is seen for both caffeinated and decaffeinated coffee. So this is obviously puzzling. What we look at uh, in EPIC is that in 15,000 people, we looked at the initial biomarkers, and we look at a number of biomarkers, including biomarkers of uh, um, hepatic function, and coffee consumption is associated with a lower level of liver enzymes measured in blood. So there is some indication that what we observe by using mortality uh, has actually, actually a biological, measured biological effect. The paper is, uh, as I say, is, uh, is under review now. Thank you very much.